Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Today's Bible study is on Luke 17. We're looking at significant passages, and this is one of the really good ones. So I'm going to ask Caroline to open up in prayer, and we'll get right to the Word of God. Caroline, please. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for that song. It's so true. You are indeed so beautiful, Lord. God, we take this time now to close off our ears to everything that we have heard in, in this noisy generation that we live in. And Lord, we center in on your word because you have the words of life, Lord. You are the one who has the words of wisdom. And we want to know what those are. And we want to understand your word. God, we are living in a generation where there is so much knowledge and it's too easy to say, well, I didn't understand this part. Now we can go digging, we can search, we can Google, we can do so many things, oh God. So we take this time tonight to hear, to understand, put a spotlight, Lord, on anything that needs to change in our lives, anything you want to bring to our attention. Father, we humble ourselves. We will hear, we will apply, we will change as your spirit leads and guide Pastor Alex as he leads us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We'll go to the word of God. Now, Christina, watch for people coming in. Let's go to the scriptures. Here we go. All right. Uh, I've been asked the question as a pastor many, many times, how can I become more like Jesus? How do I grow in the Lord? And uh, that's a very good question because sometimes, you know, you hear, ministers talk about becoming like Jesus and that we need to become more like the Lord and they don't give us any practical guidelines as to how to do it. So I wanted to share a little bit on that before I start the Bible study. The only way that you can become like Jesus is through a work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. But the question is, how does the Holy Spirit work to make you more like Jesus? That's, that's the issue. <clears throat> now, some people think it happens mystically. You have these supernatural hyper spiritual experiences where you go to the mountaintop and you are instantly transformed into a new creature. Uh, there is not too much validity in that because the Holy Spirit does not move exclusively through spiritual experiences. He will give you spiritual experiences, but they're always based on a knowledge of the word of God because the spirit of God gets his mandate and gets his operating instructions from the word of God. So knowing that I can only be like Jesus if the Lord does a work in my life. And knowing that the word of God is essential, the way I can become more like Jesus is to examine his life, to see what he had to say, to uh, watch the way he dealt with different situations, to observe his character through the gospels and after that too, but through the gospels especially, because in the gospels we see what Jesus thought about various important issues and we see the character of Christ displayed and as a result, the character of God as well, because he is the second person of the Trinity. And we learn a whole lot. Now, when we see something in Jesus, or we learn something about Jesus, or we hear something or read something about Jesus, and we realize, well, that's not true in my life. That's not evident in my life. Um, I have not yet developed that. Well, how do you develop it? Do you develop it through discipline? No. Do you develop it through your own efforts? No. You develop it how? You develop it by throwing yourself on the mercy of God and asking the Holy Spirit to take this uh, truth that you've learned or this issue that you've dealt with or this thing that the Lord has showed you and make it real in your life. So it is a combination of the word being received and you understanding that you have not lived up to the word, but you want to because you have a new nature and going to the spirit of God and asking him to make that word real to you and that's how the promises of god work that's how the fruit of the spirit is developed and that's how the gifts of the spirit are discovered and then after that the lord will put you in situations this is the amazing thing he'll put you in situations where you will actually have to use or display the characteristic of jesus that you wanted to develop in your life for example let's say you have no patience so you read verses on patience you realize how patient jesus was and you receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you need to be more patient. Okay, now what do you do? You try to develop patience in your life through your own efforts? No, that would be a waste of time, and it'll never work. You throw yourself on the mercy of God, and you say, Spirit of the living God, I've read in the scriptures 
verses on patience, and I want patience to develop in my life. And the Spirit of God will begin his transformative work in your life. And I guarantee you that shortly after that, you'll be put in a situation where you will have to display the patience that you asked for. And if you asked in faith and the Spirit of God does his work, that patience will rise to the surface. So this passage, Luke 17, deals with four or five issues. I don't remember exactly how many, but quite a few of them. And we're going to take each one separately, beginning with Luke 17, verses 1 and 2. So here's what Jesus said. He said to his disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown, he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. So uh, here's a little diagram here I have of an offense, which is taken from the Greek word, which I'm going to reveal to you in just a moment. Jesus pointed out from the start, from the beginning, that the Christian life would be filled with obstacles and setbacks and direct threats and attacks. And most of those would come from people. Now, the Greek word for offenses means walking along a path and tripping on a stick that you don't see in the road. And because of the stick being in the road, you trip over it and it knocks you down or it makes you stumble. So somebody gets in the way of your Christian life. Somebody becomes a hindrance to you. Some event or some person, usually in this context, it would be a person, and they offend you by getting in the way of your Christian development or your Christian character or provoking you in some way that would tempt you to be uh, other than Christ-like. So what are some of the offenses that we can encounter in our walk with Jesus? I'm going to take one or two from each person if I can. What are some of the offenses that we can encounter in our walk with Jesus? We'll start with Mark. Mark, what, what uh, offense can you think of that would be thrown at us in our Christian walk? Well, the, the first thing that comes to mind is um, when you have disagreements with your children. Oh, okay. You want to elaborate on that? Um, these are some of the things that when, when, when you're in, a, in disagreement, with the way they're conducting themselves or what they're doing. Um, so you, that, kind of, you kind of butt heads with each other. And then, you know, as a result of that, you know, there's usually a fallout. Okay. And how would that affect your, uh, your walk with God? <laughs> well, first of all, it's very, first of all, it's very disheartening. Yeah, of course. Very disheartening. You get impatient and uh and it, you know it just blocks you from what god is trying to accomplish okay so a wayward child a child not serving the lord and disagreements with that child could be an offense all right christina what about you what offenses can come up in the christian life you can you can speak out of your own experience by the way when i ask you so christina what about an offense from you uh... I guess sometimes when you give rebukes. Rebukes such as think, an example? Like a rebuke on a sin or something. I don't know. I'm really off the top of my head right now, but um, almost like a, oh, you think you're holier than, than me? Like, oh, I see. Okay. Let me bring up your sins. Like, don't, don't pull that card on me, Christina, and start name calling and not taking it well there's that kind of offense is what okay so being, being accused of not being a christian of not being a christ-like all right yeah how about you caroline what uh, offenses would you tell us about um being cut off because of what i believe so being cut off completely uh, as in not being able to have a relationship with someone which is the case for me right now oh so uh, that could be an offense if I let it to be an offense, but I don't. I forgave. I pray for them. And any time offense tries to rise up, I go back into praying for them. You can't hate somebody that you pray for. It doesn't work. Okay, thank you. What about you, Ali? Uh, what, what offenses have, have been your experience? Well, I just experienced one, one last night and okay. um, I, um, where I was told that, you know, God was things that were not good and uh, very aggressively was oh. told that. And I took a great deal of offense where at one point in time of the conversation, I felt the anger built up. In you? In me, yeah. yeah. 
yeah. I actually literally could feel that anger build up. And, um, you know, you just, I, what helped me was I knew that I live in Christ and I know Christ lives. I mean, I, I, I excuse me, that Christ lives in me and, and I know that, and I knew that, and I just kept focusing on that to not let the anger consume me. Okay. So, yeah. So. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. What, about, what about you, Gerhard? What, uh, what offends you? Turn on your microphone if you can hear me. Uh, people who either uh, manip manipulate scripture, like take it out of context, or invent prophecy to mask their own control issues. Okay. So people misusing scripture and uh, trying to manipulate you uh, through spiritual issues. Okay. What about you, Oliver? What offends you? Whenever um, somebody who's close to you, who's or maybe is not so close to you, is um, inviting you to compromise. Oh, somebody who invites you to compromise. Yeah, yeah. Compromise on your on your on your biblical values. Yeah. Okay. On, yeah, that, on your on your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Yeah, that would come up quite a bit in the Christian life. No question about that. What about you, Justin? What offenses have you faced? Um, I would say a little, it's similar to the context of, uh, what, uh, Oliver was saying, but, uh, um, being truthful, uh, when the world wants to pull you in the other direction. Yeah. So, um, I'll give you an example. Um, and this was like, a a long time ago I had sold, I had sold one of my cars that I owned. And I was signing with the documents. I, I believe it was with my dad. We were just signing the documents. And then on the documents, uh, I think it was my dad that uh, just invited me to say, well, just put, just put this value on, on the, the car that you sold. Almost like a little bit like a similar situation that you shared on Sunday with uh, Ananias and Sapphira when you shared that story on Sunday. Yeah. But, so instead of like saying that your car value you sold it for three thousand, just say you sold it for two thousand, and that way you'll pay less taxes to the government. Oh boy! So uh, so that was a situation that I faced. My dad wanted me to change the value of what I sold it, what I actually bought it for, but I said no, 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 it's not, it's not right. I'll just I have to put the the right value that I sold it for, and even if I have to pay more taxes because of that, so be it. You know, so yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about uh, Pastor? Yes. Um, there's something very powerful too concerning offenses that my uncle had taught me. Because um, there was another time where I didn't react very well to an offense, where um, we were badly served in a cafe. My sister was treated like crap, and I went back and I, uh, and there, there I had that high and mighty attitude, and I, I said to the baris, I told her off basically. So then I came back and I'm like, uh, she's not going to treat you like that anymore. And my uncle looked at me and he's a pastor and he said, uh, now, can you go back to that barista and can you witness to her of Jesus? So when we stay offended at somebody, we can't go back and tell them about the gospel. Not really. And, and that is something that the enemy is happy about. That's one of his things. So it's not just that we have offense in our own life, but on top of it, now we can't help that person to get to know the Christ, the Christ our Savior. That's a great point. We'll end on that point. Uh, just to add to it, I just wanted to say that Jesus was really good to us by telling us that there would be offenses, that we should expect offenses. Things are not going to be easy in the Christian life. It's not going to be smooth sailing. Not everything is going to fall into place. In fact, it could be the exact opposite. You could have all kinds of adversity. You could have all kinds of attacks and threats. You could have uh, all kinds of situations where it's difficult and anger may rise up, fear may rise up, all kinds of emotions may be stirred up because of it and what jesus did is to do us a favor by telling us expect these things to happen in your life and prepare for them ahead of time to be able to meet with them in peace and to be tranquil and to be at peace with all men and not to allow poisonous emotions to get to you i know it's a hard lesson to learn but at least he let us know offenses will come but here's the thing remember jesus said in that passage woe to them through whom the offensives come that's important too. So if somebody hurts you, somebody offends you or puts a stick in the path, 
and makes you stumble in your Christian life, the Lord will deal with them. It's not up to you to deal with them. Romans chapter 10, I believe it says uh, the, that vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we'll leave it in his hands and uh, be gracious to people, which brings us to the next passage. Here's the next passage coming up right now, which is interesting because it kind of falls into place with the previous one. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and seven times a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Where's this monkey? He's very offended, as you can see. And I thought that was a cute little poster. So I put that in. Jesus was talking about uh, forgiveness here, which is right after offenses, which I find very interesting because forgiveness kind of goes in with how to deal with offenses. So he says, if your brother comes to you and sins against you seven times a day. Now, when the, the number seven in the Bible means a continual singing, sinning. Could be 70 times a day. Could be 100 times a day. Every time he comes to you and repents, you shall forgive him. And so that talks about the release of forgiveness. So my question is, why is unforgiveness poisonous to your soul? John Cardos, I'll ask you, why is unforgiveness poisonous to your soul? Don't forget to turn on your mic. Yeah, it's on. Uh, uh, geez, you, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tricky one. Yeah, I know. Uh, why, why is it poisonous to your soul? Yeah. Uh, because you can't, you can't do what the Lord has uh, commanded you to do. You can't love if you have forg unforgiveness. That is it's, true. It, you cannot yeah. love. Uh, so, so all you think about is, is getting even with somebody, you know? Uh, and I, I have, I have a lot. I, I mean, I know I, I've read enough about unforgiveness uh, to, to take it to heart. Because you don't get your prayers answered either if you're, you're, you, you, don't have, you don't forgive. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I, uh, I, just, I just find I have, th I have things that, that offend me. Like uh, many things, people who disrespect me uh, and uh, people who, uh, who uh, anti-Semitism offends me. I hear, see it on TV all the time now. Yeah, and I, get, I fall into a rage, and I have a bloody rage. I want, I want, I want those people killed. I, I, I get really, I, I don't want to pray for them, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I have to deal with uh, with things, but I don't know uh, what uh, what is not forgiven. In other words, who don't I didn't I forgive? Because there's so many incidents in my life. I don't. I, I have to ask the Lord. Who, who it is that I need to forgive. Yeah, you know? so you go back to, on the list. Yeah, you go through. So I can, yeah, something, you know. Anyway, that's that's really all I have to say. But. All right. How about you, Sister Bev? Uh, why is unforgiveness poisonous to your soul? Don't forget to turn on your mic. Oh, well, I, I, I'm retired now, but I, I, I had very, very uneasy time while I was working. You couldn't read a Bible. You couldn't say the name of Jesus. You were ridiculed and that sort of things. And um, it, it separated the staff. And, and so you, a group would be here having lunch and another group would be there. And um, you were intimidated really as to proclaim the gospel. So it was, it was difficult at that time. Now it's a, it's a bit different because you can choose who will listen and who will have something, you know, most likely positive to, to respond. To yeah, it. thank you. What about you, Tom? Why is unforgiveness poisonous to your soul? Well, you, well, for, first, you, you'll have no peace. No. Uh, the, your, the anger in you just becomes bigger and bigger and you become uh, a, a man that no one wants to be around. And... Uh, you you can't have a, a, a healthy relationship with God if, if you don't get rid of it. Yeah, that's a great point. A great point. One thing about uh, something that Tom said that struck out in my mind was uh, about the anger building up. When somebody hurts you and you don't forgive them, they hurt you a thousand times over because you keep thinking about it all the time. And you replay the incident over and over. So they don't just hurt you once. They hurt you every time you think about it. And every time you go over it again in your in your in your mind. They hurt you again. 
And so the anger just builds up and, and I'm, the unforgiveness would be far greater for somebody who's hurt you a thousand times than for somebody who's hurt you once. But if you keep feeding the unforgiveness, it'll be as if they hurt you a thousand times. It'll be much more difficult to let go. All right, let's move on. Thank you. Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. I think before the forgiveness happens, especially in Caroline's case, uh, when she was talking about the waitress. Listen, um, I've been a waiter for, um, for, for a few years, a couple of different places. Right. And if, some, if somebody addressed me because they had a grievance about uh, certain things or the way I served them, uh, I think I'd be the type of person that would receive that, that would appreciate receiving that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, that would be that would be beneficial to correct me and to, you know, and basically in the Bible, we read a couple of times where, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you need to rebuke your brother, yeah, uh, you know, who's in a sin. And uh, we've heard about righteous indignation. So it's not like we don't have a say and we should just shut up and just forgive the other person blindly. I think we also have to stand up for what we believe. I'm not saying shove it down a person's throat. But I think, you know, we have to make known, make known who, who we represent. Yeah, I understand what you mean. And let the chips fall where they may. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, walk away from there with unforgiveness. Obviously, we have to forgive and obviously we have to, uh, you know, reconcile uh, whatever we're feeling. But the thing is, is we still have to, we still have a voice. Yes. So I wouldn't want to squelch that with anyone. Okay if at all possible. So the two points that you made were one, somebody may be saying something valid and legitimate that may offend you, but you should give it some consideration and try to improve because they could be telling the truth. And secondly, if somebody says something that is not true and is out of line, you need to point it out to them and forgive them also. So I, yeah, I listen, that, that rebuke, that rebuke or correction that she might've given that, uh, that, um, server, uh, you know, could have changed their whole t entire perspective. Could have, could have. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next question. This passage deals with the heart of God with regard to forgiveness. Seven times a day refers to an ongoing offense. So Jesus is saying, forgive somebody when they say, I repent, over and over and over again, no matter how many times they sin against you, if they repent, you'll forgive them. So what does this tell you about the heart of God towards sin? Oh, that's a tough one. Oliver, what do you think? What is Jesus saying about himself in that one? Please repeat what you just asked, Pastor. I said that Jesus said that every time somebody comes and repents for their sin before you, you should forgive them. So what does that say about Jesus? Jesus is very, very, very forgiving. And he's very understanding and he... And he will, he will punish. However, he will also be forgiving. He always be, he always forgive us the forgiveness that we need to comfort us in the midst of our punishment. Okay, there's a couple of things in that passage I find very interesting. First of all, there's a condition before you forgive somebody. What's that condition? Valerie, did you notice a condition? Like something has to happen before you forgive somebody. Has to repent. Oh, thank you, Valerie. <laughs> sorry I couldn't hey. you, know, you have to repent that. so yeah. sorry that person has you to forgive me now no, no. I, don't know you, I don't know you say that in English because I was looking at the French version which says je le regrette just like I feel bad I feel guilty about it yeah I don't know how to translate it in English so you did all right and the second thing was uh, is that uh, somebody may be repenting and not really be sincere I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And Jesus is, saying, Jesus is saying, if they say, if they just say I repent, forgive them, which I find very interesting. Because why would I forgive somebody who's not sincere? I'll tell you why. Because judgment belongs to God, not to me. It's not up to me to discern if somebody is sincere when they tell me I, 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 I repent. My job is to forgive and to follow in the character of Christ. And he will take care of them. If they're not sincere, I guarantee you God will deal with them. Very difficult to do. I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying I'm an expert at it. But man alive, you know, I'm supposed to forgive somebody if they're not sincere. Jesus puts no qualification on it. If somebody says, I repent, you must forgive. Okay, let's move on to faith. 
And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, this is a very interesting point. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. Very interesting. The apostles say to the Lord, increase our faith because they felt they needed more faith. But the Lord says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll be able to do extraordinary things. Now, I looked up a couple of pictures of a mustard seed. There is a mustard seed right there, little tiny seed, and it grows into this beautiful herb right here. Look at the size of that thing coming from that little tiny seed. So again, where the, the verses uh, mentioned, and even in Matthew 17, 20, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing shall be impossible unto you. So in other words, it doesn't take a lot of faith to get results. Only a mustard seed of faith is enough. But I've witnessed many people believing God for something and it doesn't come to pass. So what are a few faith killers? What are some of the things that kill faith? You're believing God for something, but something comes in and destroys your faith. What would it be? Christina? Doubt. Doubt is one. What's another one? Uh, okay. Setbacks. What? Setbacks. Belief. Setbacks. Valerie, what kills your faith? Not your faith, but anybody's faith. What would kill your faith? Anger. Anger. I like that one. Okay. Yeah. When I mean anger, it's extremely hard. When I'm really, I mean, top. You're talking <laughs> about anger. You're, ta Ugh, I have you're talking about blowing your, blowing your top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really like. Uh, well, we yeah. got a few people in here that are good at blowing their tops. Well, you're going to have smoke coming out from the eyes, the nose, and the ears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't get angry often, but when I do, get out of the way. <laughs> It's, I, you know, I've only had two fights in my life, and I try not to get angry because when I get angry, I'm angry enough to kill somebody. I, I'm telling you the truth. If I get angry enough, I will keep beating on that person until I kill them. So I try not to get angry because oh, I know what I'm capable. I know what I'm capable of when I get angry. So yeah, yeah I hear. All right. You. How about uh, Justin? What's another faith killer? Uh, another faith killer. Yeah. Uh, Definitely, like lying, for example, would oh, be. Uh, oh, that's a good one. Sure. Yeah, lying would be lying. one. Yeah. How about you, Gerhard? What's a good faith killer? I mean, good faith. They're all bad, but what's a faith killer for you? Godlessness. Uh, when other Christians like get in the way of God's plan or my plan, that way. Okay. I, yeah. When people oppose you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good. Uh, Ali, what's a faith killer for you? Michael. Actually, they were mentioned both lies and anger. Lies and anger. Boy, we got yeah. some angry. We got some angry people here today. Yeah. <laughs> we got some real smoke builders. Okay, very good. Uh, what about you, Mark? What's a faith killer for you? Unbelief is a faith killer. Yeah, I think somebody mentioned doubt. I think it was Christina that mentioned doubt. Anyway, there are faith killers. For me, I'll tell you the number one faith killer in my life when I see other Christians not living all out for Jesus. I have such a hard time with that. It's not even funny. Maybe because I'm a pastor, but I don't think so. I think I had this tendency even when I wasn't. There's nothing that kills my faith more than seeing people who have none. And I don't like hanging around with people who display no faith whatsoever. But on the issue of faith, let's go back to the passage. I noticed something about this uh, passage. Whatever faith the disciples had, it wasn't producing fruit. So there was no point in increasing it. That is the point that Jesus was making when the disciples said, increase our faith. See that? Increase our faith. And Jesus said, no, no, no. It's not necessary to increase your faith. Because if you had faith, <coughs> excuse me, if you have effective faith, faith that works, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed, and you can pull up the mulberry tree by the roots. So I thought to myself, what kind of faith is effective, and what kind of faith moves the hand of God. Since you only need a mustard seed of it, it's ridiculous to ask the Lord, give me more faith of the wrong kind of faith. So obviously, faith has to have a characteristic that moves the hand of God. So Caroline, what do you think is the faith characteristic that is necessary to move the hand of God? Obviously, disciples didn't have it, so um, I'm trying to understand the question. What is a faith characteristic? Because I know yeah. God is pleased with faith, and so yeah, he's moved he, by faith. Yeah, okay, but here's the point. The disciples, 
obviously in their minds had some kind of faith, right? And they mm -hmm. said to Jesus, increase our faith. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. You're off the mark. All you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. So they were talking about two different types of faith. And what do you think, they, what do you think that was? That's my question. How come the faith of the disciples was ineffective? And the faith that Jesus was talking about is effective, even if you have a little bit of it. What's the difference? Um, well, I'm thinking of, of a portion of scripture where he said to, uh, for example, when they prayed and they couldn't get rid of the demon, and he says, this one only comes up by prayer and fasting. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it can't just be, oh, well, I have faith in this scripture. I have faith in this promise. You, you have to also live a lifestyle of, of prayer and fasting. Okay. What about you, Tom? What do you think? Um, I think it's when you, you, you reach the point that you, you trust God completely, no matter what's going on in your life. Yeah, okay. And uh, all you need is a mustard seed of that kind of faith, and you can move mountains. So the disciples were not at that point yet. They had a measure of faith, but it wasn't faith that had total dependence on God. It was a human work. I'm going to work myself up to believe. So it became a personal work. And I have a question. I'm yeah. sorry, I had a question, Pastor, because the, the, the thing of the, the quantity of faith for me seems kind of not very logical you have faith or you don't have it you believe or you don't believe That's exactly. if you really believe at heart you don't need to have it cannot be measurable in quantity it's not like having a liter of faith or <laughs> you you believe or you don't but that's exactly what that's exactly the point that jesus was making is that whatever the disciples thought was faith was actually unbelief yeah it was not real faith no it wasn't and now my question is what is real faith and uh believing god <clears throat> and depending on him completely. But there is one aspect about faith that is very important that I think a lot of Christians miss. miss. Can anybody tell me what it is? James said, James said, faith without works is dead. Yeah. It has to be active. You have to act on it. Okay, all right. That's so that's one that's one aspect of it. Yeah, okay. James oh, also said not to be double-minded, that the double-minded men will get nothing. Yeah, that's right. You have to believe. Uh, Jesus said, if you believe in your heart that you receive what you speak, you shall receive it. Yep. One other thing that's missing that I'll tell you about. Being fearless and bold. Being fearless and bold is, an act, is a product of faith, yes. But I'll add it to because we can go on forever. I believe in my heart that only God can give you that kind of faith. That kind of faith comes from the Holy Spirit. And that kind of faith can be asked for. And that kind of faith can be received because everything in the Christian life comes from God. Nothing comes from us. And there's nothing that I can do to work up enough faith, like Valerie said, to get that quantity, that three or four or five gallons of faith that will get my answer. It won't work. But the faith that God gives me that completely abandons myself to him and knows beyond any shadow of a doubt that he will move is the faith that moves the hand of God. And that's the point that Jesus was trying to make in that passage. Okay, let's move on. It's well, also a faith that doesn't tell God what the timeline should be. Well, yeah, of course, you don't tell God what to do. He's sovereign. He, uh, and uh, so, a question? yeah, what, yes, Mark. How does that line up with the gift of faith? <clears throat> I think it's basically the gift of faith is on, a, on, a, on another level. I think the gift of faith is a situation that seems impossible to human, uh, human resources. That seems even beyond beyond our capabilities, and somebody in the church receives faith to be able to proceed forward. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we were buying our church building way back, we found out that uh, there was an oil tank in the ground. And the board members wanted to cancel the sale of the church because there was an oil tank in the ground. And one of our board members said, no, if we believe God is giving us this building, we're going to buy it even if there is an oil tank in the ground, we're going to believe that the land is not contaminated. I said, okay, we're going to go on that. There was one board member out of five. So we went forward anyway, and uh, we found out there was no contamination in the land, and there was no oil in the tank that was in the ground. That is the gift of faith for a specific situation where none of us had the faith to believe that we should buy that building. It's the only example I can think of at the moment. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which is... 
what is the theme of this passage? I don't even give you the theme on this one. I'm going to try for you. I'm going to get, um, allow you to try to figure it out for yourself. So here we go. Now, which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once, sit down and eat. But he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, Jesus talking to us, when you have done all the things that you were commanded, say we are unprofitable servants and we have done what it was our duty to do. Oh, man. <clears throat> so faith produces results, no doubt about that. And Jesus knew that his followers would be used mightily and they would be used in different areas, as it says here. So why is this passage spoken right after his talking about faith? What is the message of this passage? Does anybody want to take a guess? It's not a clear answer, so you'll have to really think about it. Let me leave it up. What is the message of this passage? And I'll summarize it for you so it doesn't get too complicated. If you do something for God, your attitude should be, look, I did what I was supposed to do. I'm a servant of the living God. I, I am an unprofitable servant. I just did what was my duty to do, and that's it. I don't expect any extra reward. So what do you think the message is in this? I think it's like a soldier, a Roman soldier doesn't expect, you know, pay for what he does or to get a pat on the back. It's just what he's being called to do because he is a soldier. That's his duty. So okay. we are, are soldiers of Christ. We, we, we are, are soldiers, you know. We okay. should have the same attitude. That's a good answer. We're soldiers in the army of God and we're expected to obey our commander in chief. And it's, uh, we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back and give ourselves glory when we obey, because this is what is expected of people who are transformed by the Holy Spirit and have the Holy Spirit living in them. We obey. It's, it's just part of the Christian life. It's aberrant and unnatural and weird when Christians don't obey the Lord. Anybody else? What is that passage teaching us? I'm taking a guess, but humbling yourself. Ah, there we go. That's exactly what it is. Jesus knew that his, that his servants would be used mightily that we would uh, be used in healing and deliverance and saving people's souls. Uh, he would use us in comforting the, the brokenhearted and doing all these great things and give us all kinds of power and uh, anointing. And the message of that passage is with great power comes great humility. In other words, the more you do for the Lord and the more he gives you gifts to be able to advance the kingdom of God, the more you should be on your face before God and not get too proud of yourself or think of yourself more highly than you should which is a lesson that many preachers today need to hear. The more anointed you are, the more power you have, the greater your ministry, the greater your humility must be. And uh, that is absolutely true. Now we go to gratitude. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off and they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And so when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourself to the priests. And so it was that they went, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the nine, the other nine? Were there not any, uh, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. For your faith has made you well. Isn't that interesting? We just talked about faith and we talked about uh, humility. And this Samaritan showed faith and humility both. Now, lepers were total outcasts because the disease was highly contagious. So it's interesting that there were 10 lepers and they were living in Samaria. Look at that. See where they were? He was going through Samaria. What were nine Jews doing in Samaria? Well, very simple. If they had lived where the Jews lived, they would have been outcasts. They would have been treated badly. But I guess in Samaria, they found some kind of comfort. So we had ten, nine Jews who were living in Samaria, and one of them only was a Samaritan. And he was the only one who was faithful, the only one that rather who was grateful. So this passage gives a hint of how people will respond to the gospel. What have you learned? The fact that a Samaritan was the only one who thanked Jesus is the clue. What does this passage say to us that a Samaritan was the only one who came back to thank Jesus for being healed? And it has to do with the reception of the gospel. 
and how people will respond to miracles. Anybody want to take a stab at it? What do you think, John? They were, uh, they were humble. Uh, they were humble because uh, the Jews would not, uh, would not associate with them because of uh, various reasons. And so they, they, they were not considered, uh, considered important uh, for, for, for the, the Jewish neighbors who they respected. Yeah. They did respect the Jews. Well, but uh, 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 I guess I guess that's why they were like in a, in a state of humility, so that that anyone who who did something for them, uh, they were more grateful. No, it was only the Samaritan who was grateful. The Jews were not grateful. The Jews went on their way. The, the Samaritan. No, that's what I'm saying. The, no, the Samaritan, Samaritan was yeah. was grateful. Oh, I see. Uh, so, whereas the, the Pharisees were not grateful. They they okay. didn't even want to admit who he was. Okay, let's clarify. It was the, the nine Jews that were lepers were not grateful because they were not humble. And they, took, right. they could, took, took, took for granted that Jesus healed them and went back to live in Jewish society. Right. They were in Samaria. Right. The Samaritan, who was already an outcast because he was Samaritan, who already was had no respect from the Jews, even because he was a Samaritan, who was considered a low life and an outcast. And on top of that was a leopard, a leper showed gratitude because of the great work and the great healing that Jesus did. Okay, that's what you're saying, right? Because of his yeah. humility, because he was broken to the end, and when he received this great miracle, he glorified God. So nine out of the ten were not grateful. One out of the ten were. So what does that tell you about miracles? And the preaching of the gospel, too. It also shows that people... Um want more the the healing and the and the miracles than they want the actual savior and the healer themselves that's one point yes we had a guy in our church who used to come to our wednesday night prayer meeting his name was aldolfo and he had leukemia he was dying and we started to pray for him and after about three weeks of prayer he was healed completely he had lost all of his hair because of chemotherapy the cancer was gone he went into complete remission came to the church couple of weeks in a row and then after that we never saw him again because the miracle was not enough to bring him to christ and he was not really grateful for he was grateful for a short time but it didn't bring him to follow christ so miracles do not change people is there anything else we learn about how people respond to the gospel through that passage we unfortunately see um, a negative consequence to that and that is is that's why there are not a lot of miracles done. Uh, exactly. That's a good point. I didn't think of that, but that's good. Yeah. An excellent point. I guess one of the points that I noticed is it's interesting that the Samaritan was the one who acknowledged Jesus. That's not the first time that happened. You remember the Samaritan woman who had five husbands and the one she was living with was not her husband. She received yeah. Jesus. She was a Samaritan. Do you remember the story of the good Samaritan? The priest passed by the man who was bleeding in the yeah. ditch. The Levite passed by the man who was bleeding in the ditch. These are people of God, supposedly. But it was the Samaritan who stopped and helped out. So for me, that tells me that uh, how the gospel was preached and received is that the Jewish people who were the heirs of the promise, the heirs of the covenant, will reject Jesus as a whole. And people like us Gentiles, <laughs> the scum of the earth, the low lives, the, uh, the rejected, the outcasts, will be children of the kingdom of God, which is why Jesus said there'll be people from all the nations sitting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of the kingdom will be cast out. And this story of the uh, lepers kind of reinforces that to me. And that's how I feel about it. All right, next one. Very good. I think we're coming to the last section, which is the kingdom of God. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees, no, we have two more sections. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, here it is, or see here, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. What did Jesus mean by the kingdom of God is within you, Tom? And why did he say that to the Pharisees? The hard one. Uh, well, <laughs> Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign. Let me see. The, oh, come Let's see the kingdom. Come on. And Jesus says, oh, no, 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 the kingdom is not here or there by observation. The kingdom of God is in you. Why would he say that to the Pharisees? Because he was there, present. 
that's one thing. Yeah. Anything else? Well, he wasn't. In, he, they weren't believing him, so yeah, so they couldn't. They couldn't, yeah, they couldn't the, be in them. You're on, you're on the right track. Yeah, they didn't believe in him, and it wasn't in them. So as a result, what fruit were they producing? Well, this is the same as the face, as we were saying before. Yeah, I mean, you. if you don't have faith, if you don't believe, what do you expect that it would come just like falling from the sky suddenly? No, it didn't work. Not... The, Pharisees, exactly. the Pharisees were looking for some kind of external sign for the kingdom. And Jesus was saying, hey, the sign of the kingdom is the transformation of the heart. You know the kingdom of God is coming by the changed lives all around you of people who believe in Jesus. So stop looking for the clouds to split. Stop looking for lightning and thunder. The kingdom of God is here right now because I'm here. And if you believe in me, there will be results in your life that will demonstrate that the kingdom of God is already here and the physical kingdom is on its way. Okay, very good. Nice answers from everybody. And then finally, then he said to his disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, Look here, look there, but do not go after them and follow them. For as the lightning flashes out of one part under heaven and shines to the other part of under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things to, and be rejected by this generation. And to this day, the Jewish people stumble at the thought of a suffering Messiah, even though it's all through the scriptures. And even Jesus himself reinforces it just before he went to the cross. Now down here, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom and it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all, even so it will be when the Son of Man is revealed. Is he <laughs> In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. So I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed and the one will be taken and the other one will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles or the vultures will gather. Here's a couple of little posters about God destroying the earth with fire. That's what's coming. And he will not destroy the earth with water, which, is, which has already been. So the last question of the day is, what does this tell you about the return of the Lord? And what did Jesus mean by verse 37? Wherever the body is, the eagles will gather. So the first question what does this tell you about the return of the Lord? Chris, uh, Joseph, what do you think? Uh, can, I, can you repeat again the, uh, the passage, Pastor? Okay, uh, I'm not going to read the whole. I'm not going to read the whole passage again. Okay. What, yeah. what does it? Do you remember any part of the passage? Just the last part where Jesus was uh, telling them, describing to them. Okay, I'll come back to you on that one. Christina, what, what does it tell you about the, the coming of the Lord? That passage. Business as usual. Aha, uh -huh. business as usual. You mean to say me, to tell me. Now, this is very interesting. We're in the middle of a pandemic. More judgments are coming. If you read through the judgments of Revelation, there's some terrible things coming on the earth because the Lord will rain judgment down on the unbelieving. And you're telling me that business will go on as usual while these things are going on, and that the return of Jesus, after all these judgment, will be a surprise? If that's what you're telling me, that's exactly how it will be. <laughs> business will go on as usual, no matter what's happening, no matter what terrible things are going on. And uh, people will be totally shocked when Jesus comes back. So what does it tell us about us and how we should prepare, Caroline? Continue doing the five pillars, praying, fellowshipping, being of service, praising God. 
What did they? What did Jesus mean by one will be taken and one will be left? Because he talks about the Lord coming with being seen and throughout the whole heaven, from one end of the heaven to the other, and then he talks about one being taken and one being left. What's that? Rapture. Yeah, that's right. He talks about both in the same passage. Yeah. And now back to Joseph. Joseph, what did the Lord mean by where the eagles are, where the vultures are, the corpses will gather? I mean, I'm gonna say the other way around. Where the corpses are, the the vultures will gather. What did he mean by that? Is Joseph still there? Well, the the vultures uh, don't actually um, go for the uh, uh, whatever they they want to eat, which is alive. They usually uh, look for uh, dead bodies or corpses of, yeah. uh, of animals. Know that my 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 point here is is that like uh, whichever way we look at it is. Um, the vultures um, eat dead, rotten uh, bodies. Um, I, I don't know why God is comparing uh, uh, vultures with that, except that for me, I look at it on the other side as what the eagles got. The eagles get their energy. They fly higher because they're always eating fresh meat, not yeah. uh, dead bodies or cadavers of uh, yeah, but in, the, in this case, the word eagles is a bad translation. The original Greek word is vultures. So this is yeah. where the vultures are, where the corpses are, the vultures will gather. And Jesus meant something by that. Now, you just said that vultures eat dead meat, right? Yep. You can expect that all the time, right? If you go to Africa and there's a dead carcass on the ground, what's the possibility that there will be vultures around that carcass? Because they are, uh, that's where they are. They gather just like uh, sinners, where the head, where the sinners are. There, there will be. A, uh, that's why I guess is comparing. One will be left. One will be taken up. That's so right. those believers will be taken up, whereas the uh, the the, uh, the rest of the world uh, or whoever or the sinners will be left behind. And then, and then that's when the enemy will come in, and and take them. That's Just like uh, the vultures uh, will will take the cadaver or the dead bodies. A really interesting uh, interpretation. Uh, that's a very interesting creative interpretation. What Jesus meant was, is that just the same way that if you see a dead body on the ground, there will be vultures. And it's obvious because that's how vultures behave. The same thing will be with the kingdom of God. You won't have to guess that the kingdom of God is coming because there will be signs all over the place that indicate that the kingdom is coming. Where the vulture, where the corpse is, the vultures will gather. So if you see earthquakes, famine, war, pestilence, all the things Jesus mentioned, you can be sure the end of the end of the world is coming right behind it. That's, that's what, what it is. So what does that say about us now? We're pretty close. And that's it for this week. So I'm going to ask Mark to close in prayer. Thanks, everybody. Mark. Father, thank you for these reminders that you give us in, in your word. And I pray that, Lord, as we focus on absorbing your word, on digesting your word, Lord, these things remain real in our, in our lives because, Lord, we need to be ready. We need to be ready when you come back. And not only that, Lord, we need to be on our guard. We need to serve you with all our hearts. We need to have our eyes open. We need to pr even pray for opportunities, Lord, where we can serve you. And Father, I just thank you for your word and thank you that, that you're coming back for us, Lord. That you're not leaving us here, Lord, in, a, in this mess that we're in. Thank and God. Thank God, Father, that you've given us the resources to be able to stand, Lord. And... Uh, Thank you, Lord, for your for your word. Your word is the double-edged sword, oh God. It pierces the hearts and marrow and bone, Lord, of all those who receive it. So, Father, help us to go forward with that word. And, Lord, whoever accepts it, praise God. Whoever re rejects it, well, they'll be answering to God for that, too. Yeah. So, Father, I ask that you bless everyone that's in here, encourage everyone in here. If anyone lacks faith, Lord, I pray that you pour faith into their lives for whatever situations they're going through. 
I pray that you bless each one. If anyone has an infirmity, oh God, I pray that you would touch that, that they may be healed, that they may be delivered, made whole, oh God. Father, I thank you for the pastor and uh, the word he brought forth to us, a timely word, always a timely word, Father, and your word is timely for us. So I just want to ask a blessing for him and I and his family, and I just pray that you continue, Lord, to work through his ministry as he speaks to us, as you speak to us through him every week. Father, we commit this time to you, and we ask a blessing for the entire week to come for each one that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, thanks, everybody. Good night. Uh, Pastor. Good night. Have a great rest of the week. Bye. Uh, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask a prayer uh, from everybody uh, just to keep me in prayer? Because I just, I just lost a brother last night. Oh. Uh, in the Philippines, and he died. He died. He bled to death. Actually, he didn't die of COVID. He didn't die of dengue fever. Uh, I am still waiting for the results from the. Uh, I mean the uh, papers from the hospital. Which brother? Not the youngest. Not the youngest one. He's sent the number. No, he's number four. He's also named Joseph. Okay. So, like a lot of people thought that it was me who died because uh, because of the same name. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Well, you're so uh, I know I know everyone's hurting, including me at this point. Uh, at this time, and uh, we just need uh, God's comforting and peace. Uh, so it, just okay. please uh, include me All in right. your prayers. Oh, we'll, and, do that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll do that right now. We'll do that right now, Father. We pray for the Natividad family and all the associated members and spouses, Lord. I know it's always traumatic when a family member is taken away. Even if they're taken away, Lord Jesus, through something which is less tragic than what we've just heard about being bled to death. Yes. But I pray that Joseph knew you. Did he know Did he know the Lord, uh, Joseph? Yes, yes, yes. That's we're thankful, Lord Jesus, that he knew you and, we, and he's with you now. And we're so grateful for that, Lord Jesus, because to lose a loved one who doesn't know you is really hurtful. And I just pray that your comfort, the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the embrace of God into the bosom of, of bereavement, Lord Jesus, into the bosom of comfort for bereavement, Lord God, will be especially strong in the lives of every Natividad and their spouses. In Jesus' name I pray. Yes. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you so much for the prayer. Right, good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye.